Do you know what nemesis means? A righteous infliction of retribution manifested by an appropriate agent. Personified in this case by me. If you read the Bible, Mark, you'd know that there won't be another thousand years. Right now we're in the last days as foretold in the book of Revelation. The last days? You mean the uh, coming of the apocalypse, right? The rapture. You only have to look at the signs. There are wars and rumors of wars. Now, just so the, the rest of us know how much time is left, when is the rapture supposed to hit exactly? Is it uh, midnight New Year's Eve? That's right. Uh, now, is that midnight L.A. time or, or Eastern Standard Time or what? I mean, what time zone has got in anyway? I pray for you all. Yippers. That's an old intro. Back in the days when this sacrilege was called coffee, cigarettes, and gnosis. But it seems appropriate, as this episode deals with so much timeless prophecy, myth and symbol, alternative realities, and the unbearable likeness of revelation. But hey... Heresy shouldn't be this much fun, but it just is. It just is. And it often hurts like hell because the forces of hell don't like anyone knowing they're actually running the whole of creation. Even though, as the Manichaeans and the group the Water Boys believed, we are seeing the whole of the moon. But there is no dark side of the moon. As a matter of fact, it's all dark, claimed the generation of Sid Barrett. So what do we do? Easy. You listen to this show and find every week that liberating ubic spray that corrodes inch by inch the black iron prison. This prison planet, overseen by a cosmic warden named Jehovah and his dude bro angelic thugs. This is his development build, sealed off so he can control it. He keeps it offline so the custom code he's written can't be detected and deleted. Mm, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a bubble universe ruled by an asshole god. Like Philip K. Dick wrote in his exegesis, and thanks for pointing this out, Mark J., quote, Yahweh's prime role, to keep reality from becoming dreamlike. For me, in 374, it became dreamlike. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. Welcome to that dream of you that is Aeon by Gnostic Radio. Broadcast from the virtual Alexandria through the God Above God Dat Cam. This is your 374 for all times. That dark odyssey on the seas of fate and through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy all the way to the farthest shores of imagination. As the Nag Hammadi Library's concept of great power says, we have behaved according to our fleshy origin in the creation of the rulers, which establishes law. Yet we are the ones who have come to live in the unchangeable Aeon. And as the book of Thomas the Contender states, Blessed are those who have been persecuted in their heart. It's a huge shit sandwich and we're all gonna have to take a bite. Take for instance, me, your host, Miguel Connor. Recently I was laid off for my marketing day gig. It didn't matter that my campaigns were the most effective, my work review sterling, and that I was declared by higher ups as exemplifying the vision of a global company. In the end, and nonetheless, spreadsheet management and location logic sealed my fate. Did you see the memo about this? I'm sure you can relate in some way, for this is the world we live in. Unfairness can be masked with machine-shrugging thinking. Bringing pain can be rationalized by hiding behind the tyranny of the collective. Sure, I'm blessed and grateful for your support that makes Aeon Bite a success. But I still have a two-job family with special needs children and rescue dogs. Needless to say, I'm in the market for a writing or marketing opportunity. 
so keep your ears open if you would. Meanwhile, I simply must get out of my program, Matrix Delving Mind, that tells me there is no God but the jealous God of my injured pride, and that my worth is based on corporate creeds. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day, filling out useless forms and listening to eight different bosses drone on about mission statements. I must continue that dream of us. Beyond that, I've certainly been tested lately with sickness, as well with a slew of tech calamities like dying modems, crippled wiring in a house that won't get fixed anytime soon, and failing computers. But I'm moving through because my first world problems pale in comparison to the dreamlike state of serving you and keeping your great company. I'm displaced but so are we all. We are all migrant workers cast in a shithole reality, attempting to find our way home beyond the stars. Glad you're here with me, you champion eternals and knights of Valis. Bringing in Philip K. Dick again, he did say, the true measure of a man is not his intelligence or how high he rises in this freak establishment. No, the true measure of a man is this. How quickly can he respond to the needs of others and how much of himself he can give? I know we're all afraid. But my father told me, someday, someone was gonna have to take a stand. Someday, someone was gonna have to say enough. This could be that day. So the show must go on and we must continue making reality dreamlike. I'm infernally excited that on this late January, the year of our Demiurge 2018, on show number 384, we will be discussing a most esoteric movie, The Broken Key. The film is a wonderful blend of dystopia reality, occult cinema, and thriller fantasy that takes the audience on a journey into powerful mystic imperatives. It certainly parallels introduction and overall tenor of a young bite. That of timeless prophecy, myth and symbol, alternative realities, and the unbearable lightness of revelation. It certainly starts many esoteric stalwarts like Christopher Lambert, Geraldine Page, and Rutger Hauer. Fiery the angels tell, deep thunder rolled around their shores. Burning with the fires of Our astral guest to discuss the broken key is the director and writer himself, Luis Nero. Beyond talking about his intriguing work, Luis will delve into fascinating ideas on magic and consciousness, from Horace to Dante. For more information on the broken key and other fascinating movies Luis has created, please visit altrofilm.it or check out the show notes. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties with this interview. My apologies to the imaginative and talented Luis. The Archons were gunning for Skype and as mentioned, they've been gunning for my tech in some Tarantino Mercury retrograde. So we couldn't go as long as we wanted sadly. Nonetheless, Luis does cover so much about the broken key and other arcane themes. But worry not, as a bonus for members, I'm including a previous interview with one of the chief minds in Gnosticism and Western Esoterica today. That is the August Richard Smoley. It's based on his book, Supernatural, Writings on an Unknown History. This interview was never posted on YouTube or iTunes or any of our channels. And I don't think it's even in the member section. Why? It happened around the time my brother Sean died. I was in a state of distress, and although I put out podcasts during that painful time, managing the site and all the channels was something I barely, barely did. 
Do you ever get tired of watching bad things happen to people? That's crazy talk. Ergo, it's an appropriate bonus since Richard does deal with many themes that are salient to the broken key in this show. Those are, again, timeless prophecy, myth and symbol, alternative realities, and the unbearable likeness of revelation. You'll be stimulated to the point of cosmic orgasm, I feel, as Richard never lets the aeons down. So let us to the interview with Luis Nero on his film, The Broken Key. And for non-members, a partial of Richard's discussion on his book, Supernatural. Yes, members get the full dope. That's all I got, as I'm tested by satanic forces in the desert of the real. Ah, Dolores, do you have to let it linger? Do you know that we are all broken keys, trying to open the doorways of perception? We can all lean on each other's shoulders. It's all fun and games until someone loses a third eye. And then it's Gnosis. Blockchain Gnosis. This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Luis Nero to discuss his movie, The Broken Key. How are you doing today, Luis? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for joining us, and of course we have with us uh, Van Sachi. How are you doing today, Vance? I'm hanging in there. Good, good. The best we can do these days. So tell mm -hmm. us, Luis, tell us a little bit about your background and journey that uh, brought you to uh, becoming a filmmaker. My background is uh, like a student in uh, symbology or something like that. I love a lot to study uh, antique religion. Uh, I have uh, uh, meet a, a, per a person that, li that live... Uh, long time ago in the uh, United States, uh, Joseph Campbell, I think, is my master about symbology. And then uh, my first movie was about uh, the golem, the golem sag. And then I tried to better the Kabbalah, uh, many esoteric terms. Uh, every movie that I make is uh, a journey inside symbology. And the result of this journey uh, is uh, a movie. Then... Uh, is a street link my home uh, journey with the uh, make movie. Yes, your movie was definitely heavy in uh, symbology, and you've done some great movies. You have a movie about Rasputin, a character that I'm very interested in, and I definitely want to see that movie. What exactly makes you uh, decide to do these different occult uh, movies? Do you start with an interest of what you read and like, or are there other processes that come? Many times, uh, everything starts from reading some text, and then I try to mix them and, and put some new idea about the script. And many times, I use a suggestion from from uh, other movie or from uh, other uh, writer to balance my idea with uh, some new way to narrate uh, the story. Then uh, for the broken I start from uh, uh, idea that uh, the date of uh, the pyramid is uh, 10,000 years ago and not only 2,000 years ago. And then I start from, uh, from the legend of Horus to go inside my story. For the audience, could you tell us the basic plot of The Broken Key, please? Uh, the main character is Arthur J. Adams. is a, a homage to uh, Ray Artu, that is uh, his quest of the Holy Grail. In my movie, uh, the main character is not looking for the Holy Grail, but uh, to recompose the broken key. And tell us, Luis... What about the background of the film? I like how you decided to put it in a dystopia world. Tell the audience about what is this future that people live in. This is a, a product of cyberpunk. I would like to realize a movie that uh, is not only plot 
stick something like that, but something very linked with the, the matter. And then I try to put my future uh, back in time with uh, many things that come from the, um, the narrative from cyberpunk, steampunk. And then I try to mix uh, new technology with uh, something uh, very old, very ancient. Uh, usually I use... Uh, hold the car with the new technology inside and I try to mix these things that uh, I think get uh, more interesting, give more to the audience to understand, to look to the past. In Italy, it's very, uh, it's very, very strong uh, from past to future in, uh, inside. Then uh, I would like to follow this route. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in your movie, it's at uh, 33 AD. And of course, when I saw it, I immediately thought, well, this is sort of the age where Christ was doing this ministry. Was that on purpose? Yes, of course. All the movie is um, uh, a symbology story of the journey of the Christ, because uh, the Christ uh, for me is a symbol that uh, every man has to follow to change himself and to transform himself in a god. And then is a plot of the movie, man, know yourself and become god. Is uh, For me, god is a, a tendency that men have to follow to change themselves. Then uh, is a tribute to the ministry, yes, of course. And the other salient point is that paper is rare. People use electronics and so forth. I thought that it was interesting. It was a, I got the idea of sort of censorship. Uh, people would like to control things and getting rid of paper, believe it or not, would be a form of censorship, even with all the electronics. Is that something you also did on purpose? So tell us about this interesting plot point. Yes, uh, there was an inspiration. It was Fahrenheit, of course. It's a very famous year in Europe. Yeah, um, but uh, I think my my big brothers in the future is uh, is uh, uh, wearing two kind of uh, things. Is an obstacle. Is is a, a an ally because every time you can transform. Uh, your obstacle in uh, an ally, you can change yourself. And then uh, the society tend to put you in prison, but uh, this tendency help you to change. Then uh, is a, a very uh, duality in the society. And then uh, the paper represent the gnosis, the knowledge, uh, society try to uh, cancel the knowledge. But uh, when uh, the society try to uh, cancel the knowledge, you want to, to, to find this knowledge. Then it's a prison that helps you to escape. Yeah, exactly. In a way, it's very, very Gnostic, the knowledge that liberates you. And uh, we can certainly cover that in a little bit. And uh, your movie has many promising actors, including uh, Rutger Hager, Hager, I'm probably saying it wrong, yes. a perennial favorite actor for those interested in Gnosticism, the occult, because of Blade Runner. And, of course, Christopher Lambert, who's uh, famous again yes. in the occult for his Highlander series and uh, has Michael Madsen and Geraldine Page. How were you able to get such lauded ensemble, and what makes you pursue these actors specially or specifically? I think uh, uh, the script uh, won because I send uh, the script to the agent. They read the script, they give it to the actor. They become very fan of the script. Rutger, after read the script, he called me immediately. The same uh, Christopher Lambert, Geraldine Chaplin, and many others. Because I think this actor need a new challenge because they've uh, made the history of the cinema and they want uh, to make many challenges. Then uh, come in Italy with an independent uh, director, with a, a small production, try to to create something new, something then uh, help them to follow their uh, paths. Then it was very easy to convince them. And that must be interesting, because as I was thinking about the actors in the movie, you always think, well, 
I wonder what an actor who might be, let's say, atheist or an orthodox Christian, and they're reading something that is completely different to their worldview, but they're actors. They have to play the part. Yes. Uh, do you know anything about the backgrounds, or is there any issues with it, or were they just fine with this very esoteric material they basically had to play into? Yes, I think uh, the most interesting in uh, esoteric material is uh, Christopher Lambert, I was very afraid to meet uh, him because uh, in Europe, Christopher Lambert is uh, a god oh, in yeah. the cinema. Yes. And then uh, I, I was afraid that he was very antipathic, <laughs> but uh, I <laughs> train him a uh, great man. You know, a lot of things that he speak in the movie, you know, a lot about symbology, you know, a lot about numerology. And then he is very, very modest man. It's very difficult to tr uh, find in uh, an actor a very modest man because uh, he's a very, uh, a, a very great man. Then uh, I think it uh, was a, a, a great chance for me to meet, uh, to meet him. Oh, I'm sure. God, that's certainly one actor. And, of course, Geraldine Page. She has uh, won many awards throughout her career. I know I have interviewed her, uh, actually, Charlie Chaplin's uh, yes. uh, granddaughter in our show. So it's an interesting synchronicity. And uh, what about Michael Madsen? He's uh, very known to appear in Quentin Tarantino movies. He actually appeared in The Hateful Eight recently. So he's still yeah. very much a, a very big mainstream actor, at least in the United States. I was meeting him. It was great because uh, we argue many times about the script, a script because his character uh, have a, a dead end. Uh, he tried to bargain with me, say to why I have to die. We bargain <laughs> every time about the character, but uh, it was a joke. But it was very great because he's a fool, he's a, a natural actor, Michael. And then uh, he have only to give you give him uh, input, and then he transform uh, the character in many ways. Tell us about the rest of the cast, because some uh, people here in the West, at least in the United States, might not know about. And tell us about the the two main actors, basically, uh, last name Adams and last name Eve. Yes, they are the two main characters. The one is the name, the complete name is Arthur J. Adams. Arthur Jonas Adams uh, is played by Andrea Cocco. He's a, a Japanese uh, Italian actor. He looks very similar to Kenny Rees. Uh, I need the character that uh, in this time look uh, more oriental than Italia because uh, uh, the Italy is uh, continuing transforming, and then we have many merge from uh, different race. I think in the future we have uh, the a lot of people that are half and half. And then I tried this guy in Italy. Uh, it was a great, uh, I think, a great goal because it is a is a natural speaking English. It is a good actor. Sarah Eve is a young uh, actress in Italy. His name is Sarah Eve Eva, of course. And then is the muse of uh, the protagonist. He represented uh, wisdom. Uh, she's an, a young actress that uh, looked very, very interesting. Yes, she was. I would agree. She was uh, very striking. She, she, she was almost hypnotizing when I saw them. So uh, a very interesting cast. What about any other actors? There's a one actor who has your same last name. Is that a coincidence, Luis? Yes, it's a coincidence. With uh, Franco, we work many times together. We are only friends. We are not relative. And then I think it's the f uh, sixth film that we made uh, together. It was a great uh, partnership because uh, he's a very smart guy and uh, helped me many times to understand better the American ideology because he lived many years in LA Hay and then he helped me many times. But there is a, a actor that I want to speak about is Kabir Bedi. I don't know if uh, in America is famous. In Italy is very famous. He's a, an Indian actor that uh, he play, play Farid Al-Kamar. It was very interesting because uh, between a Chuck and another Chuck, he, he make yo, yo, 
uh, yoga in the street, uh, in the church, everywhere. It was very interesting because uh, the Indian way to play in the movie is very different than uh, between us. And then it was every time in focus in the scene, it was very interesting to work with an actor like that. And I also saw that you used a Portuguese actress. I was very excited since I was born in Lisboa. So tell us about her. <laughs> uh, Maria is a great uh, woman. We, we are uh, friends. I speak with her many times about uh, her character. She, she loves to play uh, witches. Um, in Italy, we call it a masca. Is a something a witch a, a a good witch that help people to to heal uh, with the uh, herbs or something like that. She loved this part. She come in Italy uh, many times to speak about the the movie, and then uh, I think is a great actress. Is a great uh, woman too. We are very friends now. Wonderful, yes, a fascinating cast. And uh, is there a soccer player that plays a role, or was I imagining things while I was watching it late last night and and do, putting down notes? No, we have uh, the mistake about the name. Andrea Cocco is ah. a soccer player, and his actor to is two different persons. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much for the powerful god that is wikipedia all knowing and all that so <laughs> and so let's talk oh, obviously it's a film people need to watch it we don't want to give away too much to of the plot it moves very fast uh, it's very engaging but your film the broken key covers the ideas of several famous figures like dante tesla and hieronymus bosch why did you lean on these characters or what's the commonality the the glue that keeps them together the idea that these great figures these great artists share they share uh, one things they look in uh, both for the truth dante look for the truth uh, uh, between uh, the poetry tesla between uh, uh, thanks to the Science, uh, Jeronis Bosch uh, with the painting. They are they have in common the the feeling that to to looking for the truth uh, through the uh, through the uh, sorry through the heart because I, I think uh, the the science of Tesla is art because it was very inventive. He find a link between uh, ancient Egyptian and contemporary things. Uh, then uh, this is the something common uh, in these individuals. They are very interesting. And the theme of the seven deadly sins seemed to come throughout the film. Is that correct? Or why did you decide to use that? Yes, yes. I used the seven deadly sin because Dante said uh, that uh, you have to go through the seven deadly sins to transform them in the seven uh, virtue because the sin is only one facet of uh, the virtue and then when you uh, are able to transform your sin in a virtue you can uh, improve yourself and then is is the plot of the movie because uh, we use uh, uh, an ancient acronym from a uh, medieval monk that is Salija, is the acronym to remember them, the sequence of the seven deadly sin. And there's also a lot of alchemy in your film that seems to even tie with the, the seven deadly sins. It's almost like that your film is about reaching different levels of individuation. How did alchemy play into this? Yes, I, I try to put in the movie something that we call here uh, 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 the unity of the tradition. Then uh, I find something that link uh, through many different traditions, something that helped me to tell my story. And then I use something that come from astrology, something that come from alchemy, something that come from uh, masonry, something that come from uh, shamans and many things. Because I think all the tradition, to be true, they, they have to speak the same things. Only if uh, a tradition speak the same things of uh, another tradition, uh, she can she can be true. That uh, strange things for the audience, but I think it's the, the right uh, interpretation. 
I would agree. I mean, you mentioned Joseph Campbell. There is a monomyth. Yes. There is uh, something that all cultures share. And as your your movie talks about, it's about uh, finding who you are, being free by the truth, as uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, or and in a way finding immortality, or at least understanding the illusion of death. So all these themes are definitely woven into your movie. And what about you, Vince? Do you have a question for Luis? Yes, Luis. Um, I was interested in the Masonic tie-in. I seem to see uh, Hiram Abif is a Masonic name, is it not? Yes, I, but my, I try to speak about uh, uh, the legend of Horus, uh, one of the new, uh, I would say, adaptation of the legend of Horus is the legend of uh, Re, Re Salomon and uh, Hiram Abif, Hiram the Tiro, because uh, every legend comes from another legend, and then uh, the man, the the humankind, uh, only try to uh, uh, to adequate this legend, and then uh, is the the legend between the the knowledge and the the loss of the knowledge. And then uh, I try to use this part of the Masonic tale about uh, Iram Abif. I see. You know, the other thing I was wondering about is. The interludes, the, the different sections of the movie, were separated by images of planets. And so, um, was there a correspondence between the planets and the seven deadly sins and the seven cardinal virtues? Yes, there is a, a strict correspondence between uh, seven deadly sin virtue and the uh, liberal heart. Because every planet is uh, one of the liberal heart, is the, uh, the star of... Um, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know in English the stir of um, when you try to go to the paradise. There are the stir. There are seven stirs that you have to fall over to go to the paradise. Then it's the Jacob uh, stirs. Oh, the ladder, Jacob's yes, ladder. The ladder, yes. Very interesting. Yeah, indeed, very interesting. Yes, Jacob's ladder. And tell us a little bit about uh, Horus, because uh, this god is a central foundation for the broken key. What does this god mean to the film, or perhaps you, or just tell us more about this savior god? Yes, uh, when you want to transform yourself, you have to follow something. Horus is the symbol of the sun. The sun is the symbol of uh, the primordial uh, energy, primordial uh, intelligence. And then if, if you try to follow the, the path of Horus, you can change yourself. Then is the topics of the movie. If you find a tradition, every tradition you want, you can find yourself. But you have... Uh, you have to give you the the possibility uh, to find this tradition, and then I try to uh, reactualize the tradition of Horus and uh, Osiris because I think it's very near to Italian people and that they can't understand because uh, uh, Horus and Osiris they are symbol. They are translated many times in many tradition. Uh, Horus is a Christ for me then uh, we have uh, many things to follow. Interesting that you say he's a Christ. I mean, a lot of people in the occult assume that it's more Osiris because he is the, the one that died and rose again and then becomes the judge of the dead and all that good stuff. What uh, comparisons do you see with Horus as a, as a Christ figure? Horus and Osiris are the same figures as the same figures because uh, uh, Horus is the new cycle uh, uh, Osiris is the old cycle every of them are uh, one symbol there are no two different symbols uh, to understand for uh, humankind we need to translate something abstract in something uh, material and then uh, it's only a conventional we, we speak about duality but in the, in the Egyptian there isn't a duality then Horus and Osiris are the same person. Uh, Easy the two is the same person. It's only part of us. If you uh, bring from uh, Hindu tradition, uh, Occidental people think that Brahma, Vishnu, uh, uh, Vishnu and Shiva are different person, different uh, deity, but are the same person, are the same deity. Is a, a symbol, 
and then our uh, Horus and Osiris are the same. No, well said. I would uh, agree. And what do you think happened with Christianity? I mean, it seems you have these traditions where there's a oneness and it uh, emanates out. But uh, we're talking all these images really point to the same energy. Do, when do you think Christianity and your research lost that? And I'm sure it must be, not be easy. Is it must be hard living in a Catholic country where everything is so fragmented and these figures are all separated and they're carnal at the end. Yes, I think uh, uh, original tradition never lost uh, its uh, essence. Only people are not able to look at this uh, at this symbol because we lose the interpretation. But I think many tradition have in their uh, uh, substrate. Uh, something original, but people that follow now Catholic, they are not able to understand their symbol in Italy too. Uh, many people don't know why the church are oriented to uh, to ask. Uh, they don't know why we use uh, many things to understand, why we use the calis, why we use many things. But I think the tradition is still pure, but people don't understand the tradition. And a question, a little side question. How is um, Italian culture receiving the occult? Or do you see Italian culture, like the rest of Europe, becoming more secular as it's happened in France and England? Uh, how is the culture these days about the spiritual world and receiving your occult work? Yes, I think people try to start to make them some uh, question. People want to know... Uh, something by their self they want to follow some path something are wrong path uh, i can say but uh, many people ask them many questions and then when we start with the uh, one question uh, um, we have a, a second question and people start thinking again i think we are in the uh, in age that many things will change very very fast because uh, follow the indian tradition again uh, in the Kali Yuga, many things go very fast. We start we start from uh, Kali Yuga and we 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 go in Satya Yuga in uh, blinky four eyes. Then uh, uh, is a, a very very interesting time now. Oh, I would agree. And uh, do you worry? Because, for example, here in the United States, there's a big, uh, there is a worry that we live with too much false information, that we live in a surveillance state, that we are on the brink or already really are in some sort of Orwellian dystopia. Um, not even that our bodies are oppressed, but that our minds and our souls are oppressed. Do you see that over there in Europe? Does that worry you? No, I think no, because uh, I think my, my, my point of view, I don't know the point of view of many Italians because we are uh, uh, 50 million, so we think 50 million different things because it's typical from Italian. <laughs> <We> are... <laughs> yes, always arguing, huh? everything, like the Portuguese. Yes. <laughs> but I think um, everything happening for a project then if you uh, are able to transform your prison in uh, your uh, way to uh, to liberty this is the the war i don't think uh, no one can uh, can uh, shut the, the 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 truth the truth is always there we have only to find a way to look the truth and then uh, no political uh, government, uh, no one can change the world. The truth is there. I would agree, and I, I wish I could be as hopeful as you. And what about you, Vince? Do uh, you have a question, or are you being oppressed by the Archons as we speak? Oh, no. Archons are pretty much leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I have so many questions about the movie, but I don't want to give anything away. And I don't want to cheat and ask you what things mean that I'm confused about. But uh, it seemed to me that the movie itself could be seen as the broken key. Th did you have that in mind? Because it, it's a path. If people understood all the symbolism and so forth, uh, it actually could uh, kind of give people a framework for finding the truth in themselves. Yes, I think uh, movie uh, born for one one purpose, to give uh, the opportunity to the people to live the same path of the protagonist, the main character. 
this is uh, very helpful for some people because they if you if they have the chance to watch a movie many times they can understand better the symbology their part the relationship between them and the character between the ally and the obstacle i think um, um movie give the opportunity to the people to understand better his uh, own life because if you have the opportunity to see the movie many times you can uh, look to the main character and try to to look at the relationship between the audience and the character uh, like the old uh, Greek theater, you can have the catharsis, you can identify yourself with the protagonist, you can live with him. And then I think a movie is magic now. Uh, with movie, we can uh, help people to understand the better themselves, I think. Speaking of movies, uh, I didn't ask you this before. What are some of your uh, influences in film? Uh, many, many, many. many, many, many. <laughs> yeah, it's always a hard question, huh? A couple of millions. <laughs> so who would you say would your your favorite top five directors? I think David Lynch is one of my favorite, of uh, course. Amen. Yes. Hard to, did you watch the latest Twin Peaks? Yes, yes, of course, of course. Very good, huh? And then uh, him, I think uh, Stanley Kubrick is very interesting for my research. But I think in the Stanley Kubrick is uh, very inspiring because he starts talking about many symbology that uh, I use uh, for myself in my movie. And then I love a lot Christopher Nolan, contemporary director, and uh, his brother with uh, West Ward. It's very interesting. West oh, Ward. great. Yes, very good. And uh, they they are able to use very ancient symbolic and plot in the movie. They are very magician then. As I said, Alan Moore, a new magician now is the director because with the symbol, with the images, you can transform the people around you and the uh, world around. Uh, it's a very interesting interview that I saw in uh, YouTube about his life, his, uh, his idea of uh, magic in the movie. Yeah, I would agree, and I have certainly quoted Alan Moore before, talking about the magician. That somebody who went from an atheist in his forties birthday decided to become a magician, and he's uh, obviously done some incredible work as uh, as a writer and so forth. Uh, do you have a question, Vance? Yes, there seem to be geographical correspondences in Turin that you were referring to in the movie, and I was wondering if those are actual correspondences and if the architects of the city planned the city out to represent something. Yes, I think uh, um, in the movie we speak about the seven stage of, of the foundation. There are uh, people that, uh, some kind of monk, uh, that uh, before to found a, a city, they follow the star to decide where to put the monument or where to put a uh, building. And then, uh, like the old Egyptian in Piedmont, uh, that is the region where uh, is Turin, the city that is the protagonist of the movie, they follow the same things uh, like the ancient Egyptian. They try to build around the river. Uh, they put uh, the grandmother after the river. They mark the street, follow the stars. It's very interesting. Oh, I see. That's maybe why um, Arthur Adams was uh, seeing the stars superimposed yes. on physical reality. Yes, yes. Uh, everyone follow the polar star. When you overcross the duality, you have only one star to follow. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, one more symbol I want to cover is uh, the pelican, which is a very powerful symbol in the broken key. Tell us the audience. Tell the audience about this symbol and the deity behind it. That's also very important for the plot. Of course, we speak about the symbol of the pelican, not uh, the, the the animals, because uh, the the pelican is a symbol of uh, Robert. Uh, Renaissance, and then uh, uh, my protagonist has to have to change himself, have to overcome his uh, his fear to become uh, a 
perfect man. And then the pelican is a symbol that uh, is, a, uh, of course, a symbol of Christ too, that uh, he changed every time himself with his knowledge, uh, feed all people around him. Is uh, then it's very interesting symbol in the movie. It's a key symbol, I think. Tell the audience uh, what else are you working on for the future? What do you have? I, I think uh, I will work in uh, a movie about uh, um, uh, a great Italian director. Uh, I, I think in America is most famous than Italy is Federico Fellini. Do you know? Yes. Of course, yes. I uh, watched a lot of sure. his movies. And many people don't know his uh, secret life. He have a very secret life, a very interesting life and symbol uh, in uh, something like that. And then I want to tell about his secret life. The name is The Imaginary Life of Federico Fellini. And then uh, I think it can be very funny to to find in the back uh, stage of uh, his life uh, what he what feeling about his team, his topic. Wow, that should be very interesting. As uh, when I was young, uh, living in Mexico and other countries, of course, I watched uh, all of his films, uh, and that should be a very good thing. And where can the audience find out more about your work? Uh, find out about you? Yes, uh, our website uh, altrofilm.it, or they can uh, find uh, many backstage, many things, many special about the my movie in uh, YouTube. They are free. They can only tip uh, Luis Nero and then they find something. And if they want to watch the movie, where is it available? Yes, you can find it in iTunes. They are uh, in English version too. Then uh, uh, if they, I think in iTunes there is my last movie is The Mystery of Dante, of course. <laughs> uh, of course, yes, you like it. <laughs> of course. It was played by Mare Abram, the Academy Awards Mare Abram. Oh. Very interesting person, and we speak uh, the uh, about the esoteric way of uh, Dante's in uh, the Divine Comedy. Uh, it was very interesting point of view, and then uh, there is uh, available to Rasputin is my movie about the life of uh, the Russian Rasputin. It's a very interesting movie too. And then in iTunes, I think they can find everything in Amazon too, if they want a DVD or something like that. Wonderful. Well, there you have the audience. Uh, check out his movies. And uh, we need to support this type of esoteric art that overlooks the mainstream but brings a lot of value and hopefully uh, brings out the truth that will set us free. But I think that's all the time we have today, Louise. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bide and discussing your movie, The Broken Key. Thank you for, for inviting me. There is a storm on the horizon time of hardship and pain. This battle has been won, but the war against the machines rages on. Skynet's global network remains strong, but we will not quit until all of it is destroyed. This is John Connor. There is no fate but what we make. And what's this about a doctor's appointment? You're always going to the doctor. I don't feel good. So what? You think I feel good? Nobody feels good. After childhood, it's a fact of life. I feel rotten. So what? I don't let it bother me. I don't let it interfere with my job. This is the AM by interview. And with us, we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Richard Smoley to discuss his new book, Supernatural, Writings on an Unknown History. How are you doing today, Richard? I'm very well. It's good to be here. Very glad you joined us. Tell us a bit about uh, Supernatural and the process of how it came into publication. Well, uh, over the years, I've done a number of articles for various magazines, and uh, there was a point a couple of years ago at which I decided that it might not be a bad idea to um, do an anthology of them, uh, and uh, Supernatural is what came out of that. It's a collection of articles. A lot of them have appeared first in um, 
an Australian magazine called New Dawn, which uh, I don't see very much over here. I don't know if they do have some circulation in the uh, U.S., but I very rarely come across it. So uh, their uh, coverage is like here. But um, but they've been a very congenial uh, uh, place for me to write and, uh, you know, given me a lot of freedom and uh, a lot of stimulation. So uh, I certainly always appreciate that. Essentially, it's a collection of articles that I've written, oh, uh, for a number of magazines over the last, uh, well, I think the earliest is from 1997. So some of them go back away. Most of them are from the last uh, 10 years or so. They're on a you know, particular theme, which is, uh, you know, as the subject, as the title suggests, has to do with the supernatural and particularly a lot of questions that people have uh, in today's culture about things like Nostradamus, Atlantis, Da Vinci Code, um, and subjects like that. So it was uh, an attempt to cover some of those and, and see uh, if you could sort out a little bit of uh, truth from error in uh, that rather uh, fraught field. And in your introduction, Richard, you mentioned that both religion and scientific materialism seem to have uh, fallen short. Uh, the hope of a new age, you know, the age of Aquarius and so forth, the new millennium has lost its luster. And we're in a sort of a shadow or no man's land at the beginning of the 21st century. Could you explain to the listener these uh, intriguing, if not disturbing, notions? I think particularly uh, for the generation that came of age in uh, the 60s and 70s, there was uh, an enormous amount of optimism and premature triumphalism that, uh, you know, some kind of new perspective was going to uh, triumph in, um, you know, American society and in the West in general. And this really hasn't happened, or let's put it this way, it hasn't happened in quite the way that was imagined. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, things that have changed enormously, and uh, society has uh, been transformed in many uh, important ways since then. Um, but we still seem to be battling with the same old human problems, and the bright new millennial future that was supposed to uh, occur never really quite materialized. Uh, sometimes uh, with... Um, you know, the, the uh, various backing, uh, various political figures on, you know, things like uh, benefits for the poor and so on, a, a lot of people probably feel that they've regressed. So there is this kind of sense that this new age didn't really materialize in the way people had been hoping. And um, I think that's still the case. Um, I, you know, it, it's always a little uh, difficult to try to uh, pinpoint uh, you know, what the future really ought to bring or, you know, where it's really going to go. In some ways, uh, a great deal has happened in the last um, 30 years or so. But I think there was a hope for some kind of mass enlightenment uh, and mass transformation of society that, that doesn't really seem to have taken place. And, you know, instead, you know, we, we seem to, to be witnessing this increased... Um, commercialism and this increased uh, manifestation of what the uh, French philosopher René Nong called the reign of quantity. Everything is quantifiable. Everything is quantified. And, and so far as it, it isn't quantified, it doesn't have any value or is even seen as not having any existence. And in this, these ways, you know, the, the hopes of, of this new age uh, were dashed or at least left unfulfilled. There's also a sense that with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union and the communist countries, uh, there was, and, and people have, you know, historians have proclaimed this, uh, something like the end of the 20th century. But we seem to be in kind of a curious limbo now, where the, tw the 20th century has ended, and the 21st hasn't really begun. It's, it's as if we're still waiting for something to happen. And, uh, you know, this waiting takes the form of, you know, an often very, very profound malaise. And I think that's kind of where we are. In the, in the book, I say that you know, the age we live in is kind of a waiting room. And, uh, I, you know, I certainly feel that way to me at any rate. And uh, certainly even more now with the uh, hangover of the Mayan apocalypse that just came and went. <laughs> Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, that's a subject I discuss in the book as well. Now, I, I have to think that the... Uh, 
that whole 2012 phenomenon, you know, remains very interesting, but not necessarily for the reasons that people are, uh, you know, expected or hoped. You know, there's certainly been no kind of mass transformation in society as uh, um, some people were forecasting or mass enlightenment. Um, but there is there is something interesting about it, and uh, it's it's worth going into some detail about whatever the Mayans predicted or didn't predict. The year 2012 got uh, attached to a lot of uh, apocalyptic expectations. Um, as you can remember from the somewhat sensationalistic Hollywood movie that came out about it um, right. uh, a couple of years ago. So there's this kind of end-of-the-world quality about it. And curiously enough, this is nothing new. Uh, this kind of apocalyptic mentality has been here for a long, long time. And it's been part of Western civilization, really, since the triumph of Christianity. Christianity, uh, at least in its more familiar forms, or more obvious esoteric forms, seem to get going by predicting that the end of the world was going to be, you know, imminent. And, you know, people were, were saying this, you know, back in 40 AD or something like that. Uh, although, again, the end of the world never quite materialized uh, in the way that they had expected. There was still always this expectation that, well, somehow it, it, it would or, you know, might or any, at any rate. And there were uh, enormous prophecies about uh, this, this coming end of the world that uh, were extremely influential. There is a website somewhere. I don't uh, remember its name offhand. But, um, you know, it basically has this list of um, years of, of the last 2000 that um, someone had predicted would constitute the time of the end. And just about, uh, not every year, but really a very large number of, uh, of years between, you know, 1 AD and now, uh, you know, given that on. So this is nothing new. That, that uh, the 2012 phenomenon uh, is just kind of the latest manifestation of this uh, itself is, is not particularly surprising. And, you know, maybe from a certain point, it's not an interesting but. There is one thing that, that um, you know, I think uh, makes it stand out, and I think it is uh, quite significant. And that is the source of this prophecy. This is, uh, you know, a prediction of the Mayans. This is uh, not out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, it's from this indigenous culture. And again, um, you know, I want to emphasize that a lot of imaginative projections were uh, superimposed on it. But nonetheless, it, uh, it was... And this apocalyptic prediction did not come out of the uh, Judeo-Christian matrix. I would say for the first time in Western history. And I think that's very interesting and remains so, even though not a great deal seems to have happened on uh, December 21st, 2012. Uh, <laughs> somehow this didn't surprise me. I somehow knew I was still going to have to pay my mortgage and so on. <laughs> but uh, uh, it may have surprised some people. The fact that this you have this kind of apocalyptic habit, because this has been part of uh, the Western mentality that's set for you know, the last 2,000 years, has continued to survive. But it, at this point, it's divorced from uh, traditional Christianity as such. And I think that's worth pondering, because it, it does point in some ways to uh, a real, I would say, a loss of a hold uh, on the public imagination on the part of Christianity. So not to say that Christianity and the conventional forms of religion are going to vanish any day now. I don't think they are. But it is interesting to see the extent to which, um, you know, they lost hold of the public imagination, even to the point where the apocalyptic predictions are now coming from some other source. And, you know, that remains interesting, uh, you know, regardless of uh, what happened or didn't happen in uh, 2012. Dovetailing to what, with what you said, it seems uh, one of the movements, and maybe we'll have to wait till you write about it again. Uh, the next mm -hmm. apocalypse is that of transhumanism and singularity, where we become one with the machines and so forth. Do you have any views mm -hmm. on that? I mean, I guess you're talking about kind of like Ray Kurzweil like predictions right. where you know technological advancement is going to accelerate to the point where you know it somehow radically shifts. Uh, the world in which we live and, um, and you know, we'll somehow become, become conscious. Uh, united with our machines uh, in some kind of way. 
you know, I, I certainly am not in the business of making predictions, and that would, of course, include uh, making the predictions about what won't happen. There's a, there's a lot of imaginative fantasy in the part of the so-called scientific world as well. I mean, if you remember not so long ago, uh, you know, this is the year 2013, Weren't we all supposed to be wearing Mylar suits and flying around in spaceships at this point? <laughs> yeah, the flying car, where is that? They've been promising yeah, that for decades. Yeah, the flying car. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, this, this kind of thing just didn't happen. So the, the scientific world, in its own funny way, has this kind of um, apocalyptic mentality as well, uh, probably picked up as kind of a habit from the um, dominant Christian worldview. So I have to say I don't have a great you know, either hope or fear of some singularity of that kind. Um, I could well imagine that uh, machines will be more important and uh, smarter and so on. Um, but I think life will continue very much as it has. You know, these the singularities are always predicted. They're, they're always about to take new forms. And, um, you know, they're, about, they're always about to uh, change the game entirely. But they never change the, the real game uh, that much. I mean, life still goes on. People have, uh, you know, lives and loves and sorrows. And uh, I don't think any singularity is going to happen anytime soon. It's going to change anything like that. You actually probably give the best advice in your article, Atlantis, Then and Now, when you simply say that we should live without prophecy in the new age. Well, I think that's true. Uh, I think... Uh, as I said, this uh, habit of apocalyptic thinking uh, really comes out of uh, the Christian worldview. Uh, you know, to some extent, the Jewish worldview, but you know, to the extent that it's, it's, it's really been influential, it's been a Christian thing. You know, at this point, I think we have to say that, you know, the prophecies just haven't really come true. They don't. Uh, prophecy is a very different, difficult art, you know. Um, the predictions that were in the Bible haven't really been proven true, because if you read the predictions of the Bible literally, um, and, you know, if you really are taking them literally, they are seem to be predicting that the end of the world is going to come very, very soon. The first New Testament text uh, is uh, First Thessalonians, the first one to have been written, is First Thessalonians. And basically in it, the Apostle Paul is sort of addressing the question of, like, uh, uh, his disciples fears about what happens to all these people uh, who die before Jesus comes back. And, you know, the, the uh, apostle says, well, you know, the, you know, those who, you know, the, those who die in Christ will be taken up first. That's the source of the rapture theory that's, um, uh, you know, gotten so much attention in the mass media these days. So all that stuff, you know, really didn't happen particularly uh, as planned. And uh, Christianity has been trying to uh, somehow catch up with that, you know, in the, you know, the 2,000 years since. So these conventional prophecies, you know, these conventional religious prophecies didn't um, really quite cut it. Now, there's another kind of prophecy that, uh, and it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not mystical in quite the same way, but it sometimes has kind of quasi-religious overtones, which is... Um, Futurology, that is to say, the, the art of predicting the future through scientific or, or quasi scientific means. This really hasn't been too good either. Um, I mean, it's a really interesting exercise to go and, and look at a um, uh, futurological book from, from say, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, you'll be amazed, but not at its accuracy. This is kind of the, the, the problem with prophecy, and it's one of the things I discuss in the book. You have the futurologist. And what is the futurologist doing? Well, he's doing the only thing he can do, which is to predict future trends on the basis of current ones. And, you know, as we know, current trends don't continue. There are always these dislocations. There are always these uh, abrupt upheavals and um, sudden events that overturn everyone's expectations. You know, the futurologist can't really uh, deal with that because uh, he's, he's just doing using, you know, conventional economic and scientific models. The apocalyptic prophet of the sort I've been talking about has no problem um, predicting these kinds of, um, you know, wild and extreme events. 
because otherwise nobody would listen to him. You know, if, if you know, some there's some man on the street corner saying, you know, things are going to continue more or less as usual. Um, you know, <laughs> who would care? Who would, you know, they might be more likely to believe him, but they wouldn't be very interested in him either. So the apocalyptic prophet is, is entirely happy to make all kinds of wild predictions, but somehow these, these never come out. The futurologist is, is, is trying to predict things on the basis of current trends, and that just doesn't really work either. A lot of our anxiety about the future uh, does seem to come from the fact that, we, you know, unlike, unlike most animals, as far as we can tell, we can see the future sort of. You know we're going to die. You know, your cat probably doesn't. So we have a sense of the long run and what may or may not happen in the long run. We, we're able to um, use it to forestall, you know, foreseeable problems. You know, this, this capacity to foresee the future isn't perfect. You know, the fact that it isn't perfect leads to a lot of anxiety. The future's never quite as it um, was planned to be. I came across an interesting uh, newspaper article uh, today, uh, which is about a place called Doggerland. And I gathered Doggerland, which doesn't exist anymore, was this enormous country that existed, well, it surrounded Britain. And it connected Britain to the mainland. And it connected Britain even to Scandinavia. And according to this, and, you know, this is scientific studies, not just, uh, you know, wild speculation. Um, this Doggerland place uh, was inundated probably by a huge tsunami, uh, I don't know, 6,000 years ago. I, I forget exactly what uh, the timetable was. You know, and there, you know, were these people in Doggerland prepared for it? Well, no, they probably weren't. Uh, you know, we can, you know, imagine things like tsunamis and that sort of thing, and, and we can sort of prepare for it, but uh, our knowledge isn't precise enough to um, give us any kind of security about that. And I think that kind of anxiety uh, is what fuels a lot of the apocalyptic fears and expectations, whether they're attached to uh, kind of Christian mythos or uh, something else like the Mayan uh, prophecy. The other main theme in your collection of articles, Richard, is that of mind and consciousness, and uh, mm -hmm. you certainly address it in your book, uh, The Dice Game of Shiva. What role do you see the mind and consciousness taking in the 21st century? Uh, again, that seems to be the best place where science and religion can sort of agree, that place of awe that, uh, well, we'll probably never figure out. Well, there too. Um... I mean, science has, has not been really very honest about the whole consciousness thing. And uh, it's been dishonest in that every scientist that I've ever heard or read has to admit that they really just don't know how consciousness emerges from the brain. It's just a complete mystery. They can say that consciousness uh, is affected by the brain, but, you know, that was as known as a long time ago as... Um, the time of Hippocrates, when uh, uh, he postulated that um, epilepsy was instead of being a sacred disease, uh, possession by a god, you know, a brain disorder. Uh, so we know that the brain affects consciousness for a long, long time. But despite all of these uh, studies and investigations, we still don't really know quite how it does that, or if it does that. Science, in its humbler moments, will kind of grant that that's the case. But frequently it acts in a, in a rather disingenuous way as if to say, you know, yeah, well, we haven't figured out the answer, uh, but uh, we're, we're about to any day now, see. And um, it's uh, so we're so furthermore, we're so confident of this answer that and that it won't uh, change our view of reality, you know, that we can uh, comfortably sniff at all kinds of uh, religious theories and experiences and uh, hypotheses. And I think science is going to have to be a lot more humble about what it has done and, and can't do. I mean, you know, it, it, it's all very well to say, well, we're about to discover this uh, any day now. But they've been promising to do this any day now for <laughs> a long, long time. And um, I don't think they've really been very honest about it and uh, uh, about uh, or very humble about, you know, the limitations of uh, what they know and possibly can know. So that's that's um, one aspect of it. You know, religion is 
very much on the defensive, at least uh, in terms of um, the intellectual world, because it's, it's gone for a long time trying to defend extremely simplistic and inaccurate views of reality, like uh, you know, you know, very crude forms of creationism and so on. You know, this hasn't done religions any good, and you know, more responsible religions find it a bit of an embarrassment. But nonetheless. And there you have it, an electric interview with Luis Nero, director of The Broken Key, as well as a partial for our interview with Richard Smoley from his book, Supernatural, Writings on an Unknown History. Varied interviews somewhat, but ultimately dealing, as I said, with the overarching themes of timeless prophecy, myth and symbol, alternative realities, and the unbearable likeness of revelation. Yes, heresy shouldn't be this much fun, in good or bad times, as we write our own gospels and live our own myths. I won't go into the usual logory of subscribing or supporting, but if you're keen on the full interview with Richard Smoley, please visit the God Above God Dead Cam and scroll halfway down for the various forms of support and to gain access to complete interviews with your own private RSS feed. I'm dealing with a lot of demonic fires to put out, as you heard in the intro. And like all of us, I got some pieces of my life to pick up, even as we pick up the pieces of divinity that are meant to go back to the Sephiroth. Thanks for those of you who support on a weekly basis. Keep this red pill cafeteria open. Hello and goodbye as always. <laughs>